Live from Santa Clara, California. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Next Work 2015. Brought to you by Juniper Networks. Now your host, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Okay, hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for Juniper's special presentation of theCUBE. This is Networks 2015, NXT, WORK, that's the hashtag. Juniper's Customer Summit, their first summit. We have a special CUBE presentation. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE, and my co-host, Stu Miniman of Wikibon.com, our analyst in infrastructure and cloud. Our next guest is Brad Casemore, IDC Research Director of Data Center. I am super excited to have two analysts here to break it all down because a lot of action. Brad, welcome back to theCUBE. Thanks very much, really um, appreciate it. The numbers, I mean, you can slice and dice the market shares 10 ways from Sunday. I know you guys do that at IDC, do, do a great job doing that, but there's a sea change going on. We saw the Dell buying EMC, Western Digital, and HDST, huge consolidation. Oracle with their messaging last week in the cloud. All, right. all the moves are being made. The ones that have founder led with uh, you know, Pradeep is still in the company. The sea change is happening, the waves of innovation are here. Platform three is crashing on all the boats. Mm -hmm. Who's going to sink? Who's going to survive? That's the number one question. So you can, the market share will shake itself out, but what's your take right now? Data center really is a full on frontal, you know, total warfare going on right now. What's your take? Absolutely, uh, great questions. And I do think that what you're seeing is, uh, uh, I mean, we're seeing industry consolidation. We're seeing some companies being, uh, go from <laughs> being public to being private. We're seeing tremendous competition um, in the traditional data center for the amount of spend on data center infrastructure, across compute, across storage, across the network. And I think we're seeing some, of course, the whole thing that's, that's happening uh, across this whole spectrum is the move to cloud. And I think uh, obviously cloud will have um, uh, a growing impact on the uh, you know, traditional enterprise data center market. And as uh, enterprises uh, move workloads out to the cloud, that will have an effect on the infrastructure providers to those enterprises. So cloud is a huge factor going forward. And I think it's the underlying driver for a lot of this consolidation we're seeing. Yeah, I'm Brad, you and I have been talking about this for, for, for years now. Uh, how's Juniper doing? You know, we talked to you know, some of their executives about hyperscale. They said it's grown really fast. They are partnering with you know, s some big companies. Of course, they're not sharing names, but uh, you know, if, the cloud becomes what many of us think it becomes, and you know it, 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 it's, it's obviously real. Um, you know, Juniper has a few places that they play, but you know, how are they positioned for that hyperscale market? Right, that's a great question. I think uh, one of our analysts, Rick Fillers, often says, many enterprises, from you know the medium-sized ones to larger ones, in the next few years, will decide whether they want to stay in the data center business. In other words, whether they want to continue to run all their apps in their data centers. Uh, and they'll move some to the cloud, and the question is how fast they move. I think the question for Juniper is, I think they are, um, they certainly have a presence in many of these hyperscalers. And the interesting thing is the hyperscalers move forward is, they usually put out, you know, obviously they, they put out bids in their environments to OEMs and ODMs. And they look at their data centers and they say, um, here's what we're going to do, you know, in the, uh, you know, at the, with our servers, with our top of rack switches, with our storage, with our core switches, with our data center interconnect solutions. And I think for Juniper and all the other OEMs, it's a question of where you feel you want to play and where you feel you can viably play going forward in those environments. I think there's definitely a place. Like you look at the spine, you look at the, uh, you know, core routing, you look at data center interconnect, there's definitely business there still for the OEMs. It's tougher at the top of rack switch, it really is. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. We've had uh, uh, some of the big companies or seem to be making a, a, a renewed push into hardware. I mean, we were at Oracle Open World last week. Uh, look at what IBM's doing with their power systems, and as they build their kind of hybrid environments, you know, th there's hardware in there. I come here to this event, and you know, the message is really clear. You know, we're pivoting to be a software business. Um, you know, what do you think of the strategy? And as that transition happens, you know, y you know. We, we asked, uh, I asked Rami, you know, do you guys need to be private to make that transition happen? And he's like, well, I've got the full support of the board and we're doing what we have, yeah. but you know, what, what, what's your take on, on the, the strategy overall? And you know, do, do you think we're, by the time we come back next year, Juniper's a private company? It, well, great question. I'll deal with the first part of it, which was, you know, you talked about the different strategies being put forward by Oracle and IBM and, and so forth. I think, you know, Oracle's trying to sell an entire stack from applications right down to the infrastructure and they're trying to sell to uh, a lot of the enterprises where they already have a presence. 
I do think they are threatened by cloud though. And I do think, you know, over time, we're going to see some migration. And certainly new apps that are being spun up are being spun up in more of a, a, a DevOps model, more of a, an orchestrated model, uh, where the infrastructure has to be more flexible and not tied to a specific uh, software stack. Um, if you, um, you know, ask about, you know, whether Juniper will be private, I think certain companies, uh, I think it's an, open, it's an open book. I think they, right now, have done a good job of getting the activist investors on board with their strategy. And they seem to be happy with the way the company has proceeded over the last few quarters, and the company has delivered solid results over the last few quarters. Um, but maybe as they look further out with the strategy, the private option might be attractive to them, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, I, I liked a lot of the messaging here, but one of the concerns I have is uh, that, the, you know, I heard the words choice and I hear open a lot. And we've, we've heard some of these messages in networking for quite a bit. I mean, for the longest time it was, you know, I'm the alternative to, you know, the elephant in the room, Cisco. Right. Um, and, you know, open source is, you, you look at many of the other providers and everybody's hanging their hat on open. Um, especially if I look at, you know, say Contrail, it's like, well, Contrail's open now, but so's Open Daylight, and you know, there's uh, the Open vSwitch and some of the things, and, and some of the other pieces. Some of the smaller players like yeah. Medicare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Many of the players here. It's you know, everybody's working on OpenStack too. Yeah. So, um, what's your take on the strategy? Where where, where does Juniper win, and uh, you know, where where are they in trouble? Well, I think it's really interesting, right? You mentioned. Um, um, open daylight, and uh, we've talked to enterprise customers and we've done surveys, and it, it's not resonating well right now among enterprises, and I think enterprises may feel it's, you know, maybe too early, maybe difficult to stand up. I think in Juniper's core markets, Contrail has, um, has a good profile. Uh, I think the Open Contrail initiative was a good move by Juniper. And um, you know, telcos are looking at how they can use Contrail, as you, s you saw the AT&T announcement that Juniper made. Uh, I think there are some cloud providers and also some, what, for want of a better term, I'll call Web 2.0 companies who aren't hyperscalers, but basically are, you know, very much of the cloud model, born in the cloud companies who uh, have bought into DevOps, and I think that they tend to like it too. It's an open book as to, you know, who, um, how the, uh, we'll call it the network virtualization overlay market will shake out over the next little while, but Juniper's certainly got a, a strong horse in the field with uh, Contrail, I believe. What's your take on the analytics piece of this business? Because the data center is Internet of Things, yep. you know, storage ground, whether that's on-prem, private, or, or public. A lot of data being ingested in, more surface area for attacks, for security. Um, yeah. How do you see that shaking out for these guys? Are they in a good position? Or are this open platform going to be good? And Yeah, the analytics are going to become a key piece. And the analytics are going to become a key piece, not just uh, in the sense of the, um, uh, Internet of Things, where you know you would expect it to play across a wide variety of vertical markets, but I think it's also going to play a, a very critical role going forward in security, uh, and it's going to play uh, a very valuable role in terms of network visibility, especially as we move to uh, cloud environments and hybrid cloud. So, I think uh, we're going to hear more from vendors like Juniper and the other networking <coughs> vendors and system vendors about how analytics plays into infrastructure performance and visibility. It's going to so be I, a big story. So I got to get and you security. I mean, it's a, bi it's a big opportunity for them, and they've always had good technology leadership. They've always taken bold moves. We heard that from the from the management team, but I got to get into the disaggregation of Junos, which is right. which is a gamble. Yeah, it's a good. I mean, this is a this. They're moving the ball down the field. This is very much a you know uh, Tom Brady like you know play, go deep and 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 score with this one, yeah. or you know we'll see. But other vendors are not taking that approach. They're coupling Oracle, for instance, yeah. <laughs> engineered <Right>. systems, <laughs> sil encryption on silicon. Yeah. Juniper is taking a much more of a horizontally scalable approach. It's different religions. We got the Democrats and Republicans here. I mean, something's going on. What's your take on this? How do you make sense, and how, and how do you advise your clients? I think a lot of it is comes down to the customer basis that they have, right? If you look at Oracle, started of course as an application uh, and of course database, database company, yeah. Yeah. they're they're looking at you know how they can serve those customers by providing them with uh, you know uh, integrated infrastructure for those environments. I think Juniper is dealing with a, a telco environment and with cloud providers and some large enterprises who are actually looking at um, how they disaggregate, how they automate, how they orchestrate, and, and I think it's, it's pulling them in the direction their customers want to go. Um, you know, Oracle is, uh, is certainly um, trying to serve their own customers in their own way, but it, you know, I think a lot of it comes, it, it's, it's a result of where they are and where they play. 
and not just in terms of customers, but what they're providing. Right, Oracle started yeah. with the app, and they're trying to provide a an Oracle stack, if you will. Right, yeah, Juniper and that application mark, and that application mark is going to be a tsunami. We can see that kind of developing. Yeah. But it's interesting. Database trying to drive down, networks moving up the stack. Classic dilemma that Cisco, Juniper have been in for a while. So I want to get your take on the telco. Kind Absolutely. of use case, and, 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 and is that the proxy, is that the tell sign for the enterprise? Because the telcos have been building out really, well, really fast. Well, you know, a lot of it is, we kind of see it as the most advanced uh, folks out there in terms of uh, pushing innovations, whether it be in, um, uh, you know, containerization, microservices, uh, you know, new approaches to infrastructure are the hyperscale guys. Yeah. And they've kind of, they have tremendous talent at their disposal. You know, if you look at their, uh, uh, engineering teams, it's, uh, it's uh, cream of the crop, crop PhDs, uh, tremendous uh, talent in those organizations. Telcos are trying to emulate them, in a sense, right now, in, in certain respects, not across the board, but in certain respects, and they're trying to um, disaggregate in, in very many places their network, like for instance, the central office, you know, the whole idea mm -hmm. is we're going to use web scale principles there. And then you've got a lot of enterprises in uh, financial services and, and, and you know, large companies that sort of look like hyperscale, right? They've got multiple data centers, they've got a lot of infrastructure they want to automate and orchestrate. Um, tier two and three cloud providers. I think the challenge for a lot of enterprises isn't necessarily a technological challenge around architectures, it's resources and it's talent. I think it's tough for the enterprises to win the talent war when they're competing with hyperscalers, yeah. vendors, telcos. telcos. It's, it's All very right, so, good. so this is a good point. I, mean, I love this conversation because the telcos, I mean, let's kind of take it down to low hanging fruit yeah. and we'll move up the tree of self-preservation. Yeah. Telcos really were put on notice even like five, six years ago. Oh, yeah. And they saw over the top, they saw what's going on. So they've been really building out and seeing OpenStack, all these markets, they're early adopters and they're, they're jamming hard because yeah. they have to. Yeah. Is that, so there's a little self-preservation there. Absolutely. Are the enterprises at that point of self-preservation? Because well, they're born in the web companies, they're moving, you're seeing box.net, yeah. I mean, they're... I think that point probably hasn't come across a, a, the broad-based enterprise market, but I think it will, right? And we've seen this before with a number of technologies previously. As soon as um, a leader or you know a fast follower in your vertical market decides to do things a certain way and it confers com competitive advantage, right? A new architecture, a new operational model, whatever, I think that all of a sudden gets the attention of everybody else in that vertical market, in that enterprise vertical, and they say, well, I have to make the same move. I think the challenge for a lot of enterprises across not all the vertical markets, but a great many of them, is that they haven't yet felt that direct competition, although there has been some disintermediation from some of the newer companies in various vertical markets. Um, you know, you, you referred earlier to the third platform. A lot of companies were born on the third platform. Yeah. And in the last 10 or 15 years, they've been some of the companies that are disrupting some of these vertical industries. Yeah, they're nipping at the heels of the, of the incumbents. Yeah. And I think that might, that, that self-preservation moment drive, might come. Exactly, <laughs> they may feel that self-preservation and say, wow, yeah. I got to do these things or else I'm going to lose market share and I may become less relevant. So let's talk about the operational models. You mentioned that, I want to drill into that. Where do you see the disaggregation of Junos really having the big splash right away? What's the obvious landing point for that? Well, I think if you look at Juniper's customer base and, and some of the folks who've been talking about white box, like for instance, uh, AT&T, right? They've, ever since ONS, I think, Stu, you were there this year and you, know, you might have been there too. They, they were talking about uh, how they can use white box, how they can disaggregate. And I think this is a natural play for some of those telcos who are very aggressively moving down the, this, uh, this particular road. And some of those are very big telcos who have a lot of buying power and considerable influence. Um, you know, there, there may be uh, some, uh, some cloud provider, public cloud providers, OTT cloud providers who are interested in this. There are certainly some, um, uh, what I'll call again, those Web 2.0 companies, companies that are born on the web and operate on the web. Web is their primary storefront. I think a lot of those companies are already DevOps and Linux shops. They may be interested in, uh, you know, getting the power of Junos through, through disaggregation in their environments. I think there's a, there's a number of different candidates, but I think the, uh, the telco installed base that Juniper has is, is one market that they're aiming at with this. Yeah, so uh, you know, w one of the challenges we always have is that you, you know, you're fighting inertia uh, when you try to drive new technologies. You know, in the networking space, you know, I draw diagrams and you, you know, talk about the decades that it, that it takes to make these, uh, th these moves go forward. Um, you know, service providers seem to be moving faster, and you know, the, 
the the people here and the message here is about embracing change. Um, you know, how would you rate Juniper? Are, are, they, are they still, you know, for a company that's been around since, you know, really the growth of the internet, you know, are, are, they, are they driving innovation? Are their customers, you know, moving forward? Uh, you know, are they fighting for the future or defending the past, you know? I think they're, uh, you know, relative to certainly pure play networking vendors, I think they're being relatively aggressive and they're trying to embrace this change rather than let it wash over them or be reactive to it. And I think we saw that with the uh, disaggregation announcement. We saw that with what they're doing uh, with the uh, virtualized CPE. I think we're seeing that in, in a number of different areas. I think they're, uh, they're obviously trying to address all of their customer base. And their customer base may not be ready for some of this, some of their customer base. But they want to make sure they're moving uh, in lockstep with the customers at the leading edge as well as serving the ones who, who maybe aren't ready to make these moves. So, uh, you know, I think, though, on the whole, they've been, for, for a, a, what I would call a pure play networking company, not a company that has, you know, the rest of, uh, you know, you look at some of the major IT infrastructure players, uh, you know, certainly Dell and HP, they also have servers and storage and a lot of other stuff. I think, uh, you know, I look at Juniper, and I think for a pure play networking company, they've been pretty aggressive at, at trying to get out in front of this change. So, take a step back on the SDDC. You guys are analysts, too, Brad. Let's talk about who's winning, who's not winning. I mean, sure. obviously, I mean, that hype of the SDDC software Event data center, it's been out there for a while. Is there meat on the bone yet? I mean, are we seeing it? Is it NFB? Is it SDN? Is it happening? And at what speed is it happening? Can you peg an inning on it? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's Stu, and you can, you can jump in. I'm sure you've talked about this. I know I've seen some of the stuff you've written on it, too. Um, you know, I think it's, it all depends on where you're looking in the market right now. And, and certainly, you know, NFV in the telco world is, uh, is a hot button issue, certainly at the CPE where Juniper's aimed. Uh, right now, I think that's where they're feeling the most uh, uh, pain and opportunity. Um, you know, they want to uh, reduce their operational expenses. They want to uh, lower CapEx as well. They want to provide more agility. I think that makes a lot of sense there. I think we, uh, we are seeing, if you look at uh, certainly what some of the hyperscalers and public cloud vendors are doing, they've kind of done their own <laughs> software defined data center. And the question is, where can the OEMs play as private cloud happens with the SDDC? And how well can they do in that enterprise market? And I think certain verticals that's happening faster than others, and we'll see how it plays out. Stu, what's yeah, your I, I mean, definitely, I, I think much what Brad said. Uh, NFV kind of came in after we were starting to talk about SDN, and uh, it's a simpler deployment model. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just, you know, telcos had services that they have, and you know now, now it's simpler to deploy it, and they kind of own the end-to-end -end solution. Um, SDN still feels like there's there's a lot of pieces involved in it, and you know you, you've got Cisco pushing hard with their yeah. ACI message, um, starting to make some progress and starting to see some real stack solutions put putting the whole piece together. Uh, of course, VMware's got a big push with NSX, and Juniper's a partner of theirs, and th they're going to offer that. Um, I, I've gotten kind of mixed response on some of the Contrail and SDN discussion here. Uh, I, I know it's of top interest uh, to the f attendees here, but um, I was actually surprised that more of the service provider kind of, you know, as you would call tier two cloud guys aren't fully embraced in it. They're kind of looking at it, testing it, kind of get ready of it, as opposed to the big cloud guys have been using some of these technologies that they built themselves, yep. uh, you know, for years. So. Um, we're, we're getting there, as I always say, you know, are we, we knocking down some of the red flags and do I see a runway to be able to get there? Um, but, uh, you know, if, if, if we're in hockey, I think <laughs> we're still in the first period, John. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you move we, to we a hockey Canadian. analogy from baseball so. and football. Now we go right to hockey. <laughs> so, are they playing good press? Are they forechecking well? I mean, they're taking an offensive strike yeah. here. You know, they're dumping and chasing, they got the pressure on. Um, Juniper is making a big, bold move. They're taking an offensive strike, certainly by disaggregating Junos. Yeah. The new switch has been called a monster, beast, whatever, and we saw that on Twitter. Break that down. I mean, the new switch, 5200, has been called a monster. Yeah. How does that impact? You see that taking share and? Well, it's interesting because I think one of the reasons you're seeing disaggregation is because if you look at top rack switches, for the most part, right now, they're using Merchant Silicon, specifically Broadcom. And they, they all the vendors have essentially a very similar box based on Broadcom, depending on which Broadcom rev of chip they're, 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 they're using or chipset they're using. Um, so the differentiation will be occurring in software. 
and how your software works with uh, orchestration system, how, how programmable it is, and so forth. And I think at least at the top of rack, um, the performance will be similar. There are certain things you can do to maybe differentiate a little, but it's going to be the same merchant silicon, um, and is the same merchant silicon for the most part, top of rack. I don't want to use the word commoditization purely, <laughs> but it's it's heading in that direction. Talk about the data center trends. We heard, again, Larry Ellison, again, the keynote at Oracle World, bring that back up because he put some stakes in the ground. Classic you know, rhetoric and dogma we hear from, from Oracle. And it makes sense, Oracle on Oracle runs better when yeah. you're on Oracle. <laughs> so, engineer systems kind of make sense there, but he's saying push down, flatten the commodity hardware. That puts you know the server storage uh, networking vendors kind of flat-footed if you're a pure play box mover, yeah. um, which some people say Juniper is. He's also made a statement that I want to push uh, encryption and security into the, into the chip, software and silicon. So a lot of in-memory, a lot of that silicon. How does that vision and or that vector change or impact Juniper in any way? Well, you know, I think that'll play with certain Oracle customers who are very comfortable buying into a complete Oracle stack. There are some enterprises who will do that. I don't think that's going to, I don't think that's going to be play for some of the telcos that want to disaggregate and want that sort of open orchestration where they can innovate on top through software, I, I certainly don't think that's going to play at all with hyperscalers who've kind of gone in a different direction anyway with, with their uh, applications and their database technology. So I think it's a question of what you're targeting mm -hmm. and, and who you're targeting. And uh, you know, Stu, I think that's something we've talked about before. I think Oracle's got a very different conception of where they think they can maintain their installed base and, and maybe grow it over time compared to some of the other events. So, so Brad, one of the things we love about an event of this size is you get really good access to you know some of the executives there. They, they've had the analysts, you know, big room yep. down the hallway, some open sessions, some you know d you know deep sessions. Um, any you know particular nuggets that you could share as to something that you're saying you know Juniper is doing something you know really cool and you know maybe you know not getting the attention that it should. Absolutely, I think they're uh, they've done um, they've done a very good job at being. Um, it sounds weird, but bold and pragmatic at the same time, right? Because they they will work with VMware in uh, in VMware environments where they can provide the underlay and uh, gateways and visibility and, and security and so forth. Uh, security complement VMware security. Um, and they understand that NSX is, is going to be, uh, you know, certainly a force within the VMware installed base. At the same time, they realize they have an opportunity with, uh, you know, Contrail and OpenStack environments and other, uh, other telco environments as well. Um, they understand that network disaggregation is something that's, uh, that's going to be popular with a certain segment of their customer base, and they've got to embrace it and really move forward with it. Uh, I, think, uh, I think those things came through loud and clear. Um, I think they're uh, they're really trying to um, to be forward looking and to to John's point earlier. I think they're really trying to um, to embrace these changes rather than be defensive about them. And that's really important because if you're if you're defensive and seem to be you know fighting the trend, it, it's not a good thing. Brad, thanks so much for coming on your busy schedule. Thanks for sharing the data here and insight inside the cube. Uh, appreciate that. Here, sharing the data here on theCUBE, our flagship program. Go to SiliconANGLE TV for all the videos, and go to our new CrowdPages technology, crowdpages.co slash nxtwork for next work. Crowdpages.co slash nxtwork. It's a special site I just loaded up um, today, and all the videos are up there, all the keynotes are up there, all the social networks are up there, and that's powered by CrowdChat. We'll be back with more after this short break. <laughs>